Hi, welcome to Head Start, the podcast for race directors and the business of putting on races. In the tender age of 24, with no prior experience or any interest in running, Matt Trevett decided to take a gamble and launch a new 10K in his hometown of Weybridge in Surrey, UK. Matt promised local business groups and the local council he'll bring 1,000 people to the race in its first year. And, as you can imagine, everyone was very supportive of the idea. In between thinking Matt was crazy, of course. Well, fast forward a few months and Matt delivered his 1,000 people inaugural Weybridge 10K as promised and went on to produce more award-winning races in his hometown, putting the former through town firmly on the regional running map. Now, beyond the amazing story of Matt and the Weybridge 10K, today's episode is not about Matt or the Weybridge 10K. It is an episode about attitude, persistence, and more importantly, taking a lean approach to putting on races that focuses on building community, forging partnerships with local businesses, and marketing smart online, often with little more than a bunch of pictures of empty roads to go on. If you're starting out as a race director, you're going to love this episode. And if you're a more seasoned race director, getting the perspective of a young millennial colleague will hopefully help trigger a light bulb moment or two for you. So stay tuned for a really interesting discussion. Before we go into the episode, though, a quick shout out to our podcast sponsor, Give Sign Up, Run Sign Up, the leading all-in-one technology solution for endurance and fundraising events. More than 22,000 in-person, virtual and hybrid events use Give Sign Up, Run Sign Up's free and integrated solution to save time, grow their events and raise more. It is really an amazing platform Give Sign Up, Run Sign Up have built for endurance events and non-profits and you should definitely check out runsignup.com to see how their technology can transform every aspect of your race. If you're a regular listener and you enjoy the podcast, do make sure to subscribe on your favorite player and leave us a review. We read every one of them and we really appreciate your feedback. Okay, now let's get into this amazing episode. Matt, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Panos. How are you doing today? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Yeah, not too bad, thank you. Not too bad. Nice and quiet where I am. Well, thanks a lot for coming on. Where are you exactly? I'm in a hotel at the back of the Expo, the London Marathon Expo, which is at the Excel Centre. So I'm in my, my quiet hotel room. Uh, it's very peaceful, uh, even though it's not too early. Uh, but I think the mad rush is going to come very soon uh, at the Excel. Yeah, because you guys, we'll get into that in a minute, but you guys are um, actually working on the London Marathon over the uh, coming weekend, I guess. Yes, yes. Personally, I'm, I'm involved with the project. So from a uh, an entry platform perspective, we've worked with them for the last year and a half. So I'm very lucky I get to come down. I work with the entries team. Um, I get to be at the finish line on Sunday for the actual marathon. Uh, we're supporting the ballot launch that's happening this Saturday. So and we're very lucky. I get to see a lot of things happening this weekend. Um, it's nice to be back with a real event. So working with them for, I think, a year and a half now. And it's the first time you see the actual marathon happen, you know. So it's kind of surreal to be working behind a laptop for a year and a half. And now it's like, boom, something does exist. You know, there's a real marathon happening. The project is kind of ending in that way. Indeed. And not any marathon. I mean, London Marathon is a pretty special event. You can you can say who you work for, by the way. I mean, there's no... Uh... <laughs> You know, there's no censorship on that. So you're with Nuco, uh, really, really great company doing Thank registrations you. in the UK, Europe, and elsewhere. Uh, really good product. And you guys recently took on the uh, London Marathon contract. Congratulations, which is really great for you guys. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's it's good for us. We um a, a small a small French company in the south of France, just above the Spanish border. Um, we've been going for about seven, eight years. I've been helping for a couple years. So there's a few of us in the UK, and yeah, we've done we've done well. We've done well across Europe. And now we're starting to make a little bit of a name for ourselves in the UK, um, London being surprisingly one of the bigger first names that we've got. Um, and we hope to hope to continue that. But it's been very exciting for us. And we're very lucky to work with so many great event directors. That's super. I mean, you guys deserve it. I hear great things about you. Well, today we're going to be uh, going back to your race directing days. Many of our listeners would be wondering about, um, you know, all this digital first stuff that they would have seen on the on the podcast title. And we'll get into that in a sec. I should say that today's episode is a little bit different. Usually what we do is we focus on a topic and we go really deep into that. Well, today on this episode with you, we're going to be tracing 
a race that you came up with and planned and executed from inception through its very, very remarkable growth all the way to the point where you actually sold the race. And I think it's particularly interesting to trace that journey and that race with you because I've been following you uh, for a couple of years and I've been really impressed with the stuff you've been doing for the race on the digital front. You guys have won some awards, like honestly, for like a, a race that's only been a couple of years into its life, you had done amazingly well. And I'm hoping that some of the junior uh, race directors on the audience would pick up a lot of tips and would share a lot of emotions as we go through this, you know, same kinds of stuff you went through. And I think there's some great lessons for some of the more senior race directors on the podcast because you're bringing in the young race director perspective. I mean, how old were you when you, when you uh, put on Weybridge? So 20, 24, actually, when we started the pre-planning. And I did give myself a year of pre-planning. Um, but I was 24 when, when we launched the concept. Um, approaching 25 when the first race happened. This was back in 2017, 16, 17 when we started. So I'd say I was, yeah, I don't feel so young now, but I definitely felt young back then. Yeah, that's, that's, I, think, I think that's exactly the perspective that I'm hoping to get out of you today. Like the perspective of someone, you weren't even running, right? Yeah, so the perspective exactly. of someone who wasn't a runner, who was quite young, who came into this without any preconceptions, right? And you went on to have great success with the race, which we should say was the Weybridge 10K, which you've since sold. So tell us a little bit about you and a little bit about Weybridge 10K, sort of like as a summary from start to finish. I think we'll be touching on, on several things as we go along, but like just give people a quick overview of the whole Weybridge journey. Yeah, I think it's I think a good starting place is is the foundations of where that started. Like the I think getting into the space for the first time. So for me, my first, I'm going to say my first real job, I did have a few jobs before, but the first, my first step into this space, into this career, um, almost, almost came by accident. Um, it was a job that was advertised for a, a sports running company uh, called Sweatshop. Not so much as big now, um, if they exist at all, to be honest. Uh, recently bought, to, bought by Sports Direct. Um, I joined them, I think I was 20, 21 years old. So that gave me so much exposure. So at that time, um, yeah, Facebook and social media was just, just starting out. So I think what happened across the industry was any, any young kid in the office got given those platforms. Here you go, go and learn it. So at that age, I was, I was very fortunate to be working with brands like Adidas, Nike, Mizuno, uh, Asics, and giving, being given marketing budgets to, to work with, with their products and help launch them in the UK. That was exciting. That was my first spark of interest in the sports industry. I'd say it could just be the free trainers that I was getting on a on a monthly basis, but that was a that was a part of that it. helps. And as part of that company, we also worked with uh, Reading Half Marathon and the Nottingham Marathon, um, and that was called Sweatshop Events as a company. That was in, in fact owned by Hugh Brasher, who was obviously um, CEO of most director of London Marathon. So indirectly working for Hugh through many layers at that time. So I didn't manage to get that close to him. Um, but I think it was that working for those events and being in the same office environment as people that are race directing, marketing, um, growing these races. And they are quite small teams. People are quite surprised sometimes with these big events. You know, three or four people generally hold the fort um, for some of these big, big events. So I think absorbing that information was interesting. And I think from, a, from an interest peak point of view, just seeing the project come to life you know, working in a mixture of e-commerce and then seeing the events, going to the event, doing these tasks on the day, like I used to drive the lead cars for the events or even just handing out medals. It's kind of something tangible that you can see. There's a project at the end of it, something comes to life and then people cross the finish line. So that was, I think that was the interest spark. And I was very fortunate to be in that space for about three years um, and just absorb all that information, working with really smart people um, that organize these events, race direct, people the now CEO of Park Run. Um, so just all these really, you could say mentors in a way that you just absorb from. Um, and that's really, when I left that role, there was a year, a couple of years when I was out, out of the sports space. Um, but I just, I, I missed it too much. And that's where the Weybridge idea came from. I think just looking at how we used to 
have these big events, how I used to market these big events, 15,000, 20,000 people. We used to always work with our sports shops and, you know, people would come into the shops, they'd pick up their race packs, you'd meet them face to face. And then coming out of that space and um, I had a, I've got a really good friend that owned the sports shop, which I think we'll come on to in a minute as to who, who we worked with. Um, and thinking, look, here's a sports shop here. Here's a town that I grew up in. I've got all this knowledge in my head. I can just take that and launch a business. And I think it's, yeah, that's where it comes from. And I think sometimes you get these ideas and you sometimes call them, I think I call them gold, golden nugget ideas. Sometimes it kind of clicks in your head and you just kind of grab it and think that's, that's going to work. There's all the right things there to make it work. So that's that's the foundations of where where it came from, why it started, and I think where the interest began. So you you actually um, grew up in Weybridge, right? Um, around Weybridge, I went to college in Weybridge, so I grew up closer to um, I'd say Guildford, um, Surrey Way. But I went to college in Weybridge. So can you put that on the map for uh, non yeah, UK sure. listeners a little bit? <laughs> I'll try. It's it's in Surrey. That's probably the best way to put it. <laughs> um, there's there's a there's a cluster of nice. I call them kind of rural countryside towns i'm going to say that so places like cobham weybridge then you're kind of edging towards richmond which is a bit more well known so i i do cl- i do classify it as, as the posh the posh areas of surrey um, which is always good news when you're marketing an event because you know people have got a little bit of cash in their pocket to spend on your race so that's another bonus and you know it's one of the real things that you think about when you're launching a business you know can people afford my products and it's the, all these things matter right so weybridge is the town you grew up in i think it's fair to say that it is within reasonable distance of london right Correct. i mean it's it's you know you can commute from london back and forth i mean it's sort of like on the like a satellite of london so you have lots of people in that area right yeah actually the river the river thames goes alongside our race village which i purposely did for that reason i mean the race village we have is a is a it's an unreal location. It, it's it's picturesque. The, I, there's a couple drone shots from two years ago, and I I do milk those on social because they are amazing pictures. And we're very lucky that we have the actual venue isn't in Weybridge. Funnily enough, it's in Shepparton, which is the town next door. But the route goes through Weybridge. That's how I got. That's my workaround. But the venue is very nice, and it is alongside the River Thames. So, you know, when we're marketing. That, that's one of the selling points. When you're when you're clever with your words, you can use things like the River Thames. People don't see it as far out as they might think. Um, there's fast trains from London. And that's important with, with the marketing, you know, because the first year or so you can target very local. But to be sustainable, you do have to think, okay, how do I get these people from London? And so when you start going into London, um, it's a whole it's a whole different ballgame. You spend a lot more cash, it's a lot more unpredictable. You know, there's lots of different running clubs. It's not as easy to get to get people. When the idea occurred to you, there were no other races of that kind. I mean, probably in Weybridge, but not even in the surrounding area. What was what was the market like? There wasn't anything particularly close. There is a nice, there's a really great running club, Elmbridge Roadrunners, um, that have a, an annual 10k. Uh, it's quite a small event, but it's they're very um, it's very loyal. Uh, they've been doing that for a few years, so they they're they're great. That was one race that I was aware of, um, and then. A couple years before I launched, there was someone attempted to do a half marathon in the area. They did it for one year. They didn't get that many people, and I think that that was their attempt. It didn't happen. Um, there's a couple. There's a, there's a couple couple things going on. People have tried. There wasn't anything in the immediate area. There's a there's a nice Thames half marathon that happens, but it go, kind of goes through through where we start. So there's a few events. I'd say we with with the local race it's just, it was super important for me that when we came in we differentiated ourselves and we also said look you guys have been doing this here you're the you're the main running club this is this is the concept i'm coming in with it's completely far end you know we're going to go and close all these roads we're going to make a big hassle we're going to aim to triple the numbers that you guys get but we're going to do it and we're going to try and use that to help you guys you know you guys can enter for cheap rates for you know as long as you want to take part as many people as you want we don't mind that's very important for me if you are coming into a space with another race. Mm. And we should say, I think mostly for uh, non-UK listeners that, correct me if I'm wrong, but like 10K sort of is the is the default distance you'd pick for a new race, kind of like in the UK, right? Because you have Park Run, which you don't have in the US, killing all the 5K stuff. I mean, meaning they do a great job, you know, putting on free 5Ks all over the place. So it doesn't really make much sense to go and do a 5K. So probably 10K, I guess, is like the entry level distance you'd offer. Yeah, I think so. And I don't know if we're touching this a, a bit early, but that that's that's kind of my whole 
not coming from a runner background approach because I looked at it and there's there's positives with that and there's negatives like I'm, I'm really transparent with it like I I've started running way more and I've been way healthier since I've done this stuff um and there's, there's positives which I can touch on and then there's there's people that think you know you might not understand as much about the route and the aspects of the running because you're not a runner yourself and that's completely fair I completely get that but the 10k distance was I looked at it and thought what would I like to achieve in the next year or two years the 10k was was good I could run a 5k um but I, I hadn't yet run a 10k and my my approach from not being a runner was what what would I want from the event and 10k for me was is a big achievement it might not be for a lot of people but at that time it would have been a big achievement for me um and I know it's a big achievement for a lot of people so one of the one of the one of the goals of the event was to get that particular community more active and I think having a tang uh, having a target beyond kind of what I'd say average you know 5k you could say a lot of people can run it just going that step beyond um and and looking at those people like me that see it as an achievable distance with a little bit of effort um that's that's where that came from and i think it is still a, an achievable distance you know and then people branch out they go to half marathons and marathons and the crazy ones go to ultras um but 10k i think is a good benchmark if you can run that then i'd say you're, you've got a good fitness level and that's my purpose for the town is to get as many people on that level and give them a great big medal at the end you know that's what that that's what that runner base wants something that they can look back on and just say that they've done it so that i think is a good distance and i think there's a lot more 10ks popping up now so you know like any business it gets competitive and it's hard to retain but one thing i always look at is the new people getting into the sport the new people that are running people like me people you know way way older than me that perhaps never did running but want to achieve something um and 10k is a good it's a good distance did you have any help when you were starting off or did you seek any help in putting on the event or did you just do it on your own? A hundred percent. So I looked at it and again, with the digital first approach, I had marketed events. I had got thousands of runners to go to events. That's one thing I knew very well. I hadn't organized an event before um, and there's so many aspects to it. So the first thing was my my colleague that, that owned the sports shop. So he. I'd say he's more practical. But definitely at the time, he was a little bit more practical than me. So being part of the sports shop, we decided to kind of launch the project together. And the way I split the task was I, I'm more digital focused. I can sit behind my laptop 10 hours in a day and make stuff happen, probably for a year and then turn up on the one day of the event and things would kind of happen. Um, but you need someone that's on the site, gets the area. He lived in Weybridge all his life. So he helped me with the route. So he was running around Weybridge you know, a few years before we even came up with the idea. So it's it's getting people that you have to accept know things better than you do. He's a runner. He knew the town. He knew what people would want to see on the route. He knew the landmarks of the town. And he had good he had good connections with other local businesses of the same nature. Um, so that's important. And then you have to accept that you don't know, or I didn't know a lot of the health and safety aspects. And that's, that's the one thing that I looked and thought, I, I don't want to cut corners. You know, I will pay whatever I need to pay. To have people that know what they're doing with the risk assessments, um, the health and safety planning, the control room on the day, the, the ambulances. First year we hired an extra ambulance. Yeah, we went full blown with the cover because those things you just, yeah, you can't cut corners. So when it came to things like that, we invested heavily. Um, race directors will know it costs a lot of money, but I think that's one area that you have to accept. And then everything else you can kind of learn. It's all logistics, right? So it's it's getting things to turn up at the right time in the right place and you kind of learn as you go but being with events from a, from a younger age it's just simple things you know that you need to order some water okay when does that need to come where are you going to store it you need some barriers you need the medals you need to do all your timings and it's just collating that and you just learn things and pick them as you go um and then the scariest thing in the first year is knowing that you've got a thousand people and thinking what's this going to look like <laughs> because you've never said it before so that whole week before, you're thinking, are they going to turn up? Where are they going to go? Are they going to go to where I told them they're going to go? Are they not? You know, where are they going to park? Is it where I told them to park? So that's that's the exciting part, I think. Once you've done that first one, it gives you so much confidence, and then you just kind of escalate it. But there are things you have to you have to look at and think. I just don't know what I'm doing. So let's pull in the experts and let's get people in that have been at the the race villages before. You know, like I know there was an event last year. Was it last year the one? kind of a, a return to racing event that Tom Tom Bedford did, I think. And there's loads of race directors that came to help out. Like those people, just having two or three in key areas 
that just know how to react to things is, is priceless. So you guys had a thousand participants on your inaugural event. We did. We did. That was my target. Wow. So that was my pitch. This was my pitch to the council because I think they thought we were a bit crazy, but they went, they went with us. So I said, I, my pitch was Weybridge is, is quite a quiet town. It's used as a through road, basically, to go to other more exciting towns. That's why I think Weybridge was. So I knew there's a business group in the town that I had a connection with that kind of try and organize events and bits and pieces. Um, there's obviously Surrey County Council that are, are very, very nice, very supportive, Ambridge Council. So that was part of my pitch was to say, I'm going to close the high street, you know, the main road in this town. It's the through road. I'm going to close it. And we're going to get a thousand people. And that's my pitch to say, look, a thousand people makes it worthwhile. That's going to generate enough of a buzz and excitement to justify me closing the roads. So I set myself that target with them. I almost had to hit it in that first year, um, which we did, fortunately, but we had to hit it. And also to cover the costs of closing the roads. <laughs> so that was also another reason we had to hit it. But the main thing was to make it a disruptive event. And that's what I love about things that I try and do nowadays is to disrupt the norm and just think of things in an alternative way. Um, and that was, yeah, that's that. I think it maybe was that pressure of having the target to impress the council. My pitch was to make it the biggest event in the town, you know, to try and prove a point, I think, that people have been doing little events for so many years and we're going to come in and do something that's going to really make a dent. You know, and bring people to the town from all the other outside, outside villages. I think, I think, I mean, and again, that's partly why I have you here. Like that is super impressive what you achieved, um, what you achieved on the first year, like coming from a background on not having directed any of those things. I, I, it sounds to me, you, you made some great decisions with, you know, where you put on the event, you know, how you put it on. And we're going to get into some of the tactics and, you know, like why those thousand people showed up. But that is like really, really impressive. Were you stressed at all? I, I guess like like financially as well, right? Because it, it's a big liability to take on. It, it is. It is. I was very, I think you have to be in the right space. So the way I've looked at it from a young age was, especially in, in my 20s, which um, I still am just about, you can, you can make mistakes and you can take risks. You're very lucky if you're still, you know, at that time I was still at home with my parents. So I can make risks, I can make mistakes, you know, I always, there's always things you can be really thankful for, you know, if things go horribly wrong, then I'm not going to be on the street. So, but that's the time, if you've got that opportunity, they're the time to make those risks and mistakes. And there was, there was a load of good things there, and there's a load of bad things. Um, putting on a race isn't, isn't cheap. The best way to drive it, and it's easier said than done, it's easier to say it now, having, having done it, is to not not focus on the money. If you go in, if you go in with the passion, everyone in business says this, but it sounds better when you've done it because it's easier to say it when you've done it. But if you go in with the passion and you don't think about the money to a degree, not completely, you've got your budget sheet, but if you go, if you come from a good place, the business will always do better. And that's, that's how the year one was approached. It was, we're just going to sell these tickets. Yes, we do have to pay for these things, but if we make a loss, it's fine. To a degree, you know, if we break even, it's fine. I'm not going to take some money out of this. I'm not going to go buy myself something afterwards. I want to create a good event for the people, and I want this event to be going for five, six, seven years. Every year, we're going to grow it, and maybe in the future, there's some money. But for now, the main platform is to give myself some credibility, to give myself a business experience, you know, push myself in the industry, challenge myself, grow out my comfort zone with all these things. That I'm not, you know, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm the best at, and how I can improve. And, and that's that's when it works the most. And every project I've launched since, and I've launched a couple things based on that money-driven idea. I think naturally it can happen as you get older. You start to think about the other side of it. Nowhere near, nowhere near is it successful, and nowhere near is good. And that's that's why. Yeah, interesting. I guess you tell me if I have this wrong. You're sort of saying the you need to spend money to make money kind of thing, right? I mean, you you don't want you don't want to be like too cheap on the event, right? I mean, the event first of all needs to be great. That's the most important thing. You can't cut corners on definitely safety, as you mentioned, but also probably not even like race experience for people, right? You don't want to do like a like a half-baked thing where, you know, like it's sort of a race, but then it's not anything special or whatever. You need to believe in it, invest in it, 
and then down the line things are going to work out right exactly you need to go full throttle and you know, closing the roads annoying people because you've closed the roads but saying to them look well it's closed now so you either take you either take part or you're going to be shut inside and that's just the reality but that in a funny way works but yeah like we i paid top dollar for the medal in the first year probably the most expensive medals i think anyone's ever ordered but they were awesome medals and it, you know it plastered social we put a hashtag on the medal which i don't know if, if anyone had done before that point london marathon are doing it this year actually so um it's a few years later than me but using things like that to kind of get the buzz so i knew first of all my post-race journey like how i leverage i've invested you know road closures i think a really amazing route best medal the best chip timing i can get that i know they're really reliable people all these tick boxes and that's what it is with a race if your fundamentals are there people don't moan about the other stuff if they, if they can turn up with chip they get a time they get a medal they like the course is accurate um then they're then they're kind of happy there's not much runners ask for but if those fundamental things are very good it helps and then the post-race reaction you know that expensive medal that you purchased getting that plastered everywhere so you already build interest for next year people want that in the next year people want to wonder what you're going to do next year the route we changed it three times in three years it wasn't actually on purpose but that helped us every year there's a different route um different road closures in place it's always kind of being changed up so it costs it costs money to do all those things but i think if you look at the first at least the first couple of years with that mindset you get you know you get all the reviews you get great footage we've got a great video um from a couple of years ago that i'm sure will be used in four years time we'll still be using content because it's so good um all the race pictures and that stuff that stuff really helps if you get it right in the first especially in the first year yeah video video images all of that stuff i mean honestly i keep telling people it's such a huge investment and as you say you know you do one proper short video once you can be using it for like four or five years and it will it will it will pay for itself in the end now that we're on the metal by the way i should mention that you know one of the really impressive things i remember from waybridge the kinds of stuff you did online was when it's the second year or the, or the third year when you were redesigning the medal or something, and then you put it up for people oh, yeah. to basically pitch in on design ideas. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I have to, um, I have to credit Holly who used to work for AAT, the company that I sold it to, um, 2019, that was her, her concept, but it's completely the kind of things that I think exactly. we're both, yeah, she's come from a similar place to me. And that's, the I mean, kind it's of such, a, such a brilliant idea, right? Such a brilliant idea. Yeah. And I, and again, these things, I trace it back to when I was first in the space, I, the Robin Hood marathon, they, every year they let the kids design the kids t-shirt, the finish the t-shirt. So they go out, I think it's with the school. So they get one design from a school. They have the final four, then everyone votes on the, on the preference. So a lot of these things did come from somewhere, like not, not necessarily the first, but it's just, I think it's just being transparent with the runners, engaging with them. You don't have to post, a lot of people say the opposite, but I don't think you have to post a lot of content. You just have to post stuff that gets people at the right moment, you know, fundamental steps, because ultimately as a race director, you don't have much time. So I've always been against the regimented way that you market things like the medal, you know, like the medal release can be your post for two weeks. You do your medal post. You can get a ton of activity, ton of interest. You can just be building up to that for two weeks boom, you release it, you get some excitement. You just have to be smart with it. You don't have to spend a lot of time. Yeah, and, and the great thing about this kind of like, uh, you know, help us design the medal competition is that it's a it's a win-win on all fronts. You're engaging your participants, right? They're excited to see what the new medal is going to be. Some of them are participating in designing it. You know, you come across as an event that's sort of like, you know, listening to your to your audience and, you know, like you're constantly engaging you have your own content sorted out for like you know three or four posts or a couple of weeks just going on about that i mean it's it's these kinds of ideas that races i think should be doing more of and i think that's the perspective because i know holly and and holly is also a young person like yourself it's these kinds of things that come from people i think who have you know who are a little bit more confident around the whole digital space and they can come up with these things because they've seen it through other brands yeah, and I think it's not having. I, I I don't know if I don't know if ego ego is the right word. I think it's not having not being super protective. Like when you start a race, I think and I think that the whole every industry is going this way. Tech companies are going this way. You know, tech companies will share their product roadmap the next year publicly. People can see exactly what they're working on in their product roadmap. It's the same kind of transparency with the with the marketing. It's like, hey guys, we need to design a medal. Why why don't you help? Like that's it. It's people know that you have to design a medal, right? 
uh, it's like virtual races that have popped up people are actively taking pictures of the delivery at their house of all the medals and then pictures of them posting them and packing them and sent them it's, it's just the reality of doing the race directing stuff and people aren't looking at thinking oh they're not they're not super professional they're not you know it's not a massive operation happening people don't really care nowadays i think people appreciate being people being genuine and seeing this is the reality of of these races you know even just before the races we have the builds that happen the day before we we share content of the race village looking a mess it's things everywhere it's just the rea- just the reality of it i think that transparency in marketing is again you don't have to you don't have to post a lot of stuff but when you do you can be very honest and direct and even having experience from postponing a race before covid i went through that that whole postponement scenario and again just i just learned a lot just being open with people transparent all the way through your marketing about everything that's happening when those hard times do hit people appreciate it so it can it can work with things like the middle but it can also work with i think everything else in the communication yeah so going back to um the planning stage for a minute so you're there with the council Everyone's super excited. Uh, very few people think you're crazy. Um, so then, so then you take this out to the local community, right? The people, the businesses. You tell them, you know, we're going to close down your high street. People generally, you know, even even running friendly people, you know, they don't take very well to you know being inconvenienced for 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 a couple of days. So, how was that discussion? How how did that um, evolve? First thing we made sure we did was before before the key businesses found out about it from somewhere else like facebook or or the council themselves before that happened we we went down the high street me and my me and my colleague tom i give him a name and we went into every single shop on the route that we planned and we went into the shop everyone that we could and we spoke to the owner so that was the whole route and there's not every not the whole route has shops we're quite lucky um but there's a few different dotted you know mini high streets that would have been affected that was the first thing. That that's your shops covered. It's not the residents, but at least you can talk face to face and say, "Hi guys, this is what we're doing. This is roughly when it's going to be. Like, we want to help you. Some, you know, some places you can't help. There's no connection. There's just no interest. It's kind of like, okay, we'll just close on that day, and they seem okay with it. But the point is, you know, your business is going to be on the route, if not visible. We're gonna we're gonna bring a thousand people, and that was always the pitch: thousand people without even getting a thousand people. It's always like we're gonna bring a thousand people. They're not all going to be from Weybridge. They're going to be around the area. They're going to see your business at least. If not, then there's going to be spectators around the route that are going to come in. You know, coffee shops, they do great off the back of the event. Um, news agents, all these kind of places. Other ones, car dealerships, they get visibility. Estate agents, they get visibility. Um, they're quite easy to please estate agents, I think. As long as people just see them, they seem to be happy. So that's what I've learned. Um, so I think that's the most important thing. Again, just going to them before they find out from other people. And then... Uh, we didn't do we didn't do this before, but with the with the residents, we did leaflet as many houses as we could, um, roughly before the road closure signs went up. So about two or three weeks before the event, you do road closure signs go up, the little yellow signs like they have for the marathon. So before those went up, we knew the date. We made sure they found out again from us. So again, a, a one page a letter written by myself with my contact number on it. Any resident could call me directly if they had a problem, and some did. I think again, just being really honest. But the the pitch was always was always from a place of look, we've we've grown up in this town. Nothing really happens, you know. People drive through it to get to other places. So you know, you've, you've got Ride London, which people aren't a massive fan of, <laughs> closing the roads. We're going to start very early in the first year. We're going to start at half past eight in the morning. It's a ten k, you know, hour fifteen, hour half. People are done. You, you won't even notice it. But what you can do is come out and you can see these people. And you know, if you can't get out of your house, then you might as well enter. And I put my number on there. Some people called up. We gave out some cheeky discount codes to people that weren't super happy. And, you know, there's one guy in particular that he was very, very upset in the first year. And I, I did speak to him a few times. And now he runs us every year. He runs the event. He comes back. He tries to get a better time. Um, I love those little stories because you're just convincing people. And he just put it in perspective, you know, hour, half on a Sunday morning. That's all it, all it comes down to. And then you just have a little tick book. Yeah. And sometimes these people, as you say, sometimes these people that, um, you know, come out and they're, they're very passionately against it. Uh, sometimes they, they become your, your biggest advocates after a point. Like if you're, if you're courteous with them and you respect them and you just, I mean, you know, people have some, some reasonable objections, right? I mean, you know, we all come from this industry and we think that, 
yeah, we all love running and the races and stuff, but you know, living in a in a small in a small town somewhere and having the the main road closed is is something for some people, and you need to address that. Yeah, and again, things that you learn and things that you, you could say people should know, but people that require carers, you, know, you have to look on the map and find all the and churches, but especially carers and care homes within your route that are cut off access. And I think we have two or three. We did in the first year two or three on that route. And then you have to arrange bespoke solutions. You know, people have to get through your road closure, get to that care home at this particular time on the Sunday. So you have to open this road closure block. So, but it's given that the right care and attention. And again, speaking to people on the phone, people can be very, can be different toned on an email. As soon as you pick up the phone, people are much easier to communicate with. You can arrange things much better. That's the one, one thing I always do. I called so many people in the first year. I would sit there on an evening and I'd just go through 50 numbers every single person had a slight issue had emailed was concerned whatever i'd call every single one and i'd tell them you know we're two young guys trying to do a nice thing in the in the town and people connect with you quite quickly but yeah with things like the carers it's again it's, it's investing as well in the right areas so the last thing you want is someone that doesn't get the care they need because you're you've got closed roads you know, that those things can very, those things can backfire very very quickly um and again, you invest in someone, a dedicated marshal. His only job is to look after that exact time, that exact road closure opening to move that car to that person. And that's the kind of decisions you make in the first year. I'm going to, that's his one job. It's going to happen because that's always going to be focused on. Do you have any idea in your first year how many people uh, were local in terms of participants and how many were out of towners? It was very high, very high locality. Um, can't remember the exact figure. It's over the 50% mark. Um, that's one stat I always keep in my head because one thing I always do is try and increase the locality every year and also the external one. That's how you get your figures up. But there's only a certain locality you can get right. You know, you're always going to reach the capacity. But it was over 50%, which to me was very big. And that, that was why it worked so well because there was nothing of that nature in that town. And you know, there's, there's a sports shop there. There's now a Sweaty Betty. There's a, a nice Waybridge physio, great people. There's a foot care center that do gate analysis. There's all these nice local businesses that we're all connected with that we, that we support as much as we can. So it's, it's the right market for it. You know, you've got some great gyms around there. You've got some George's Hill, um, quite famous gym and tennis club. So, you know, people love their fitness. Um, people have got spare time, I find, in those areas. You know, some people happily either retired early or got a little bit of money. So they've got some time to train. Um, for these kind of things so yeah it's, that's, that always helps and did people come out on the day to uh, support and spectate and cheer first year was very very tricky i did i did think i did think there'd be more people but the first year i the way i split because it was kind of a co-race director situation um probably me being very cautious but i i was at the race village my job was to make sure people actually started the race and my co-race director was in the control room so any any emergencies or or road closure situations or route problems. So I didn't actually see the route. I didn't see the spectators. And there was very limited pictures, but there wasn't that many people. So as much as we did, there was a few people that just kind of walked up the high street and was oh, there's a race happening today. <laughs> so um, that's got very that's got way, way easier. I think after the first year, um, people kind of expect it now and they know they know, oh, it's actually quite a big thing, you know, there's a thousand people running. So the video from a couple of years ago, you see people on the high street is really nice. It's really cool for us to see that. Um, but that's one thing we've tried to improve. But first year, it was as much as we tried, there was a little, still a little bit of shock. I think people were trying to go for their, their morning shop and just seeing these people running down the high street thinking, I've no idea what this is. <laughs> well, that's what happens with the first year race. Yeah. Uh, particularly in a town that hasn't seen that kind of thing before. Okay, so if it's not obvious already, Matt Trevitt here is a bit of a Swiss Army knife race director doing a million things on his own. And that's probably true of many race directors wanting to be on top of every aspect and every detail of their race. Well, whatever your style or approach, particularly if you're running a slim team that has to take care of a number of different things for the race, as most people do, you've got to have a solid technology partner by your side to leverage your time and your team's time and make the most of your resources. Give Signup Run Signup is that reliable partner you need to make a success of your race. With Give Sign Up Run Sign Up, you can literally do everything under one roof. Set up your registrations, manage your entire volunteer team, do all your email marketing, run your referral programs, coordinate your fundraising, 
and even take care of your financial reporting, which, believe me, is easier said than done when you also have complexities like sales tax to worry about. So do yourself and your team a favor, if you haven't already, and check out Give Sign Up Run Sign Up's market-leading technology solution for races and fundraising events at runsignup.com. There's a full list of features there for you, and you'll be amazed at how many things you'll be able to do once you get your race set up on the platform. Okay, now let's get back to Matt Trevitt and the Waybridge 10K journey. So far, we've got to getting the local community and businesses on board. Now let's look at starting to build the race out online. So moving from the local to the digital, right? Digital first is a term you hear uh, these days of many things, right? That people take a digital first approach. And, and I guess it's one of those terms that people attach different meanings to. From your point of view, in the context of growing the way Bridge 10K, um, what does having been digital first mean? So from, from, my, from my learning and, and experience with it, 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 it came naturally to me because that's where my that's my you know, that's my day job in the digital space. That's what I had known from a young age. So I, I'd always thought of things like that. And I think, and there's good things and bad things. The way I looked at it was, I don't know if this event's going to happen necessarily. I don't know if the community definitely wants this event. So I'm going to put some feelers out there. So the, the digital first tactic was, the first step was to see if anyone is interested, right? Anyone at all. So. And I, and I think it's like any job, you focus on the things you're good at first. So the first thing I did was I built a website, something, something that explained what it is we're trying to do. Um, some pictures of Weybridge High Street, no runners, just pictures of the town. So very basic, anything you could get that made it look like it's you know, formal and good. Anyone can do that. You, know, you can build a website nowadays. You don't even have to have technical skills. So that was the first step, build a presence and then try and reach out to people in the community. And that at the time, was really easy through through channels like Facebook. And the first thing we did was I ran a competition. The first 50 people that joined our Facebook event would have free spaces. Now it's easy to give stuff for free, but also what it did was it, it was it just gave me that reassurance that yes, okay, people understand. I've built a website, I've got a Facebook page, I've got a small digital presence. I've got 50 people that clearly see that there's something real happening. You know, they might just want something for free. But I, I looked at the people all of them, one by one, I was like, these are real people. <laughs> they do live in the town and they show some interest. And that was my first first step to kind of build. And then, you know, once you get 50 people, those 50 people speak, right? And it escalates. So it's not, it's not just a giveaway. So that's the first thing, building this website, this presence. And then, you know, the entry platform and stuff, which I knew very well from just being a little bit technical, technical minded. So that stuff came very easy. You know, I could get the tickets up for sale. I could get the website, the channels, the social platforms. Um, the Facebook event, which is very powerful, um, especially for, especially a few years ago, to so, so getting that ready was was the first one, and then I think yeah, just getting those fifty people in, and then getting the ticket sales because again, it's it's almost a reassurance thing. You don't quite know if you know, I'd sold a thousand entries to the council in order to justify closing the roads, and I had to we had to pay to close those roads, so you've got certain thresholds you have to reach. So getting the ticket sales open. Did you lean quite heavily towards? spending time and doing stuff organically uh, at first, either because of budget or because you were exploring things, or did you also go into paid stuff? It was all organic very, very early on. So, and I, I still take the same approach now, these years later. If you can, if you can attract as many people organically before you start paying for things, then that's always better. And some people, some people don't take that approach because ultimately on channels like Facebook and Google ads and people searching for your race, people are naturally going to fall on your website. So I spent the first first three to four months just messaging local running clubs. Um, I don't do that so much now because I find it quite spammy. So, uh, <laughs> but especially back then it wasn't. But it so works bad. though. I but mean, it works. it's it's a great yeah. tactic, by the way. It is, and just but just being you know not just having a copy paste right, like sending the same message to one as another. Like there's different clubs for different people. We have we have Elmbridge Road Runners. They're very you know. All the, most of the runners there are, are doing good times. They want to improve their PB. They, I, I call them you know, proper club runners. Then you have the new wave of clubs that are you know, more about fun, just getting people running, getting them up to a certain level and then improving. So you have to send different content to different people and you do that organically. 
for the first three to four months, you know, looking at the clubs, looking at their history. Okay, what's going to interest you guys? Let's talk about the medal. Let's give them, you know, this percentage off commercially because I, I know it's going to go well. These people maybe get a, a bigger discount because they're not going to get as many people. So adjusting all the discounts. And you can do that without spending any money, just your time for a good few months and just connecting and then finding you know, not just the running clubs, but there's different sports pages. There's other events you can reach out to. And you can do that. And then you can start to look at the paid stuff. And I still do that every year now when we launch an event. I, I don't don't spend anything for the first few months because I want to know that I can get all my runners without having, I think of it as a commission in my head. You know, I want to retain as many people as possible. They get the email first, the people that have done it before. Everyone that searches Raybridge 10K, there's there's no Google ads above my link. So people find me if they're searching for my race. And that's that's how we've done it. And then you, yeah, then you go into the paid stuff. But I think people underestimate how much value. And it, perhaps it is a time thing. People don't think they have the time to sit there and, and go through and do it. So that that's the way up, potentially, that people have to think about. The paid stuff, by the way, I think probably was a, probably an even better proposition back in 2016. I think you know, <laughs> these days, I, I think these days, both organic and paid are a lot harder anyway. So, you know, like organic was a lot easier back then. Paid was a lot, everything was a lot easier, I guess, online back then. True. When I say organic, that's the thing. Back then, organic was something, right? So you had you had 500 people on your page. Most of those people would see what you post. So I think organic is quite a tricky term nowadays because that's what it used to mean. But nowadays, I don't really bother posting anything on the page, to be really honest, because it's just two people will see it. And I'm like, that makes no sense to me. I could speak to Facebook on the phone, but I'm like, it doesn't make any sense. I, I utilize the events and the groups. Everyone, you know, it's not it's common knowledge now. It's not as fancy as it was a few years ago to be doing that. So it's obviously more competitive for people like me. But when I think when I think organically now, I just think of being proactive and more direct with the the other pages and the channels. Because yeah, I mean, Facebook's always going to get you to try and spend some money. Well, apart from apart from running groups back then, were there any Facebook groups or other places where you could sort of tap into? for uh, potential participants and spread the word so there's yeah so you had the, the groups weren't i think when we first started there wasn't even groups they did come around so they definitely weren't utilized that much the events the events were the most powerful powerful thing tapping into those events it was used a lot i took i kind of took inspiration from a lot of a lot of nightclubs because if you go to a nightclub they would get you to go to kind of agree to go to the next event on Facebook. So, you know, you've had a few drinks, you're going to click anything on an iPad. But it was very smart because once you're in that event, you then get all the notifications, you know, and the next day you try and leave it. <laughs> you leave all these events that you ended up joining. I took that approach with the races. Once you've got people in a space and you can do that for free, you can send an email to people to get them into an event. You can put your Facebook event on a leaflet, you know, have it in the sports shop. I, that was the main, that's the main driver. Once they're in this space, you can anything you put into that space everyone gets notified of of that of that post and people are engaged right so so the, the facebook event sort of was the facebook group back in the day kind of thing did people did people also have a chance to um post in the event themselves so basically did you have like a community thing going on in on the event page yeah exactly exactly and i think now you can moderate it so you can stop that um back then i can't remember i'm not too sure but we left it we left it going regardless so you just get a notification if something does, if someone does it, and you just have to check what it is they post, which I'm sure you're you're familiar with the process. But um, that's all it was. So you, you get the odd odd spam things pop up, but generally it's people asking about the events, right? And I, I, again, it's it's easier. It was easier back then with a bit more time. But every time you see those posts, those comments, just jump straight on, replying to them instantly. We did that for a good, that good solid first year. You know, every time someone was interacting, we were straight on it. A message would reply within five, 10 minutes maximum. That I think is invaluable. And it's very hard to maintain that. Definitely now it's very hard when you're, when you're busy. But if you can put that time in the first year, it does stay with you, I think, for many years afterwards. That reputation, quick to reply, positive or negative. But those events were powerful. And, and what it was, and I still do it nowadays. And I think, I think it's a bit of an alternative technique because you can't measure very well. You can't measure super accurately how people are converting from your ads when you're using the event response. You can use the, the tracking pixel and you can get a rough idea, but you're not you're not converting people directly from the ad to go to your website because because you're you're paying less money to get them in your event and then you're remarketing remarketing to them in that event over and over and over. So that's the way I think of it. You get them in the event space. It costs me way less to do that than it does for someone to get links 
cost me pence to do that to get a person and then you know one week we post about the medal they might get interested by that they might not the next week we post about the route they might get interested they might not and at some point you're going to convert those people so i've got an event ad running at the moment it's easy for me to get i think i got 700 800 people within the last three weeks in this year's facebook event for waybridge in december very very cheap to do once i've got them in there it's now my job to pique their interest to take part but they're in this group right or this event i call it I call it a group and i can interact with them they're going to get notifications they get automatic reminders from facebook this event's happening in x number of weeks and that, i've always done it but the it's a little bit out there because you can't directly correlate you know people you couldn't say to me, Matt, how many people directly entered from your Facebook event? I can give you a rough figure. I can export the names. I can look up my entry list. I can see who's in both. But it's one of those things, especially a few years ago, I just kind of knew it was working. You'd see the peaks go up after these posts. You'd see the entries go up. And yeah, you couldn't probably couldn't take that to a big, big race marketing company or a big, you know, big event and, and sell that concept. But for someone like a, a local race director that hasn't got too much time, you have to think like that. You can't be too much in the detail. You just have to think what's working for me. What can I play around with? What's cost effective? So using the Facebook event is still something you do today, like as a, as a, as a kind of like a place where you want people to go to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I still got the same ad tricks that I used many years ago. And I think it's still working. It seems to be. I'm waiting for the day when it doesn't. And then I think I might have to retire because, uh, <laughs> because there'd be a, a new algorithm and I'll, I'll lose my, uh, I'll lose my hack. But I still do the same thing. It was very, very powerful because it wasn't used when, when we first started. And I still do it now, but I think you just have to be smarter. Like you have to innovate. At some point it's going to cut off. So it's not the sole reliance on entries is that, you know, is that particular ad. It was in the first two years because it worked so well. That's all I had to do was that. There was no email marketing for the first two years. I could rely solely on that event. But the Facebook event, like correct me if I'm wrong because I haven't looked into this for a while. Um, after the event expires, right, or after the race is done, you lose all of that audience. Basically, I mean, you lose all of those people who've clinged to that event, and then you need to re-engage them on the new Facebook event page that you put together, right? Technically, or like I did a couple of years ago, I just changed the date to the next year. Oh, okay, so you keep all the people. You just change the date. You keep all the people. I didn't in the first year. I tried it in the second year, and it worked. And. Uh... It's okay. As long as you tell people, like, this is why the date's changed. It's, it's not been postponed. It's, it's just, a, it's just a, a clever way to do it. The same thing when we, there's a few virtual events that I was involved in and I was helping and you can utilize Facebook events and you can have it so that every weekend the event takes place and it's reoccurring. So every weekend people get a nudge automatically from Facebook about your virtual event. And it might be the weekend that they do your virtual event. You can have that running for say six months if it's one of those long challenges, you can you can use things in that way. And I think it's just using some of the, the few remaining kind of organic style tools that Facebook does have and just using them in smart ways. And then, you know, recycling old stuff. There's still Facebook events from two, three years ago. Even even small ones like we did, we do shop open days. People come into the shop, they can they can meet me if they want to. <laughs> and they can chat to the person that founded the route, Tom. They can do anything. They can ask questions about the event. Those small events that maybe had 15, 20 people, I still go back to those, I look at those people, and we still drop a post in every now and then. I'm not completely sure if they get notification, but some, some I think do. And we just keep using those, keep tapping into those people that we know are really loyal, like good, loyal customer bases. Have you not thought about um, maybe trying to grow a more permanent community you know like lots of people use facebook groups they use uh, strava clubs i mean you know pros and cons in each but they, they, they work quite effectively these you know there's many things you can do have you, have you thought about moving you know transitioning all that stuff you're doing through facebook events to a more permanent sort of like home for the community completely yeah completely and i think i don't know if this leads on nicely to the next point but that's something that when when i sold the race that came to my head was it all comes down to time and you, you know you, you know you should be doing these things and i think i got to that point where you see, you see the shift happening in the facebook groups and think you know you need someone that's in here hosting stuff regularly we have got something set up it's nowhere near the activity that or the time spent i think that we could put to make it really powerful which is frustrating when you're preaching because i know what i could do in there to make it powerful um, but you just have to prioritize your time right where you see the time happening but that is that is the new wave and that is much more valuable than any 
I'd, I'd say to race directors, don't you know, post once every three weeks on your page, but spend all your time in that group. Drive as much traffic as you can. Um, but you're right, it is, it is the way forward with it. It just needs, it just needs some time and attention and, and love and care. What was the issue with the sale? Did this come up sort of thing? Like you mentioned the sale of the, of the event there. Yeah, I think you get to, for me, it was, well, there's many, many different avenues of, of work I was doing. There's, there's a few reasons the, the sale happened. One of them related to this was a time thing, right? When the, when the event's growing so quickly, when it's mainly yourself that's driving that event forward and you think, okay, for this event to grow, there's a couple of paths I could take. You know, it could become 100% a full-time project for me which might not be the right way. You know, one person with limited skill set might not be the way this race grows, you know, to a 5,000, 10,000 person race in the future. Or in this case, like you could sell the event or you could part sell as in kind of what I did and still be involved in the event, but have a team of people that would be doing this for way longer than you have that can take your concept to the next level. They can, you know, spend more time on the marketing, the Facebook stuff, the social Get, look, get a little bit of structure as you grow, a little bit of the regular comps, which you do need as you get the race bigger. So that's kind of linked into that, kind of accepting that you haven't got as much time that you think that you should have to make the race be as good as it was in that first year, the first couple of years. And that's the honest realization, I think, that happened. So beyond Facebook, when you started out marketing the race, were there other channels that you uh, spend time on? Was Instagram a big thing back then? Did you, did you do anything outside of Facebook? Instagram was, I think, just starting to become a become a big thing. So I think I think we were probably we were probably one of the early adopters of using that for a race. We've got quite a nice quite a nice page now with loads of content. So um, I roped in. <laughs> I think at the time my my younger brother was way more fluent with Instagram than I was. So that, that was I made it I made it sound like a cool job, but his job was to take the pictures and use the Instagram, which is very hard, right? Instagram being a picture based platform when you've not had an event. It's like, what do you post? <laughs> that makes people interested. Exactly. What What do you post? I guess. So we. So the first thing we did was we walked. I walked around the route, and I took a picture every every few minutes. So I got a picture of just, and it was just roads, and then you know the turning, and then the high street. That was the first thing. So that kept us going for a couple of weeks, <laughs> just the pictures of the route. But it's not necessarily. You have to post the most amazing pictures, but you just have to have simple captions. You know, like. This year we're closing the roads. This is, um, I don't know, St James's Road. This is Desborough Island. This is Walton Lane. A picture of a main road in Weybridge, and like we're closing this road, and then just having that content there. And then I did. You could use hashtags in such a way, very limited ones, very local to just the Weybridge stuff. So things like Weybridge, Weybridge businesses, Weybridge mums. I always use that quite a lot. Um, just people like groups that you know are active. I've got the time to look. Is it that up. a hashtag? Weybridge Mum. It's the best hashtag hashtag for Weybridge. So um, it's, it's really? our best customer base. Yeah, we're we're over over fifty over fifty percent female. There's more female than men, and the age range is. I'm, I'm not saying all mums are the same age. It's kind of 30, 30 to forty. That's that's our biggest market, and I think it's great. I think that's. I, I don't know if any other races had that, especially in the first year. But that that was my prime market in the beginning because you know they everyone's exercising i could see people running on the streets when i was growing up around the town and when i go to college and i was like they, they need something to do they're, they're doing the running um there should be an event here for them so so you walked around took some pictures <laughs> said you know yeah like you know in a few months time this is going to be quite busy we're closing this street down and you just did hashtag waybridge moms that's it that's that's the secret but um, <laughs> it got more <laughs> that's that's the that's the thing right that's the transparent that's the transparent truth of it. And then you just start to post more pictures. So it, then you start to find sponsors, right? So you can take pictures of the sponsors. You can get some leaflets printed. You can set up a stand. One thing we did was outside the sports shop, I just bought a table and some chairs. And I had a bit of paper with a just a, a list of, I could put people's names in. Everyone that walked past the shop, I just sat there just selling the event to them on the street outside the sports shop. And I had a few leaflets that I designed. Um, I'm an average graphic designer, but um, I could do something that looked, you know, reasonably presentable. And that's it. That's why I love the local, the local stuff as well as the digital stuff. Like we, I know we talk about digital first. That was very much where that was the comfort zone, right? That's why that happened first. Me going out on the street and talking to people face to face about an event. That's completely outside of what I would do. Completely outside the comfort zone. And what I found was the more I did that, 
the more you improve, the more you you get to know the audience, and yeah, you just you just get better. And when you're talking about something you're passionate about, it just comes across. And I think that that was something I didn't want to miss. So yeah, we did, we've done everything like that, and then we took a picture of it, of course, and stuck it on Instagram. But um, that that's when I realised with those with those platforms, you just need content so badly. And I think the first race, um, if you, I'll shout them out if it's okay, Sports Action Photo really nice photography company I, i've used different people um they, they're great guys they take such good pictures and we did free free pictures in the first year so no one paid for any pictures i said take as many as you want but take pictures not just of people running i want pictures of people with their medal people in the village people sitting down people families i want kind of the opposite i don't care so much about the running pictures people know it's a running race right they're going to assume you're running i want pictures of like emotions and I think probably I hope to think I spent more time with them than maybe other race directors do. But you know, I spend a lot of time with the photo guys, the video guys, to brief on exactly what I want. Again, digital first, right? It's it's the comfort thing. But yeah, that's when we realised with those platforms, you just need all that content. And I still use pictures from 2017. It rained a lot on that day. <laughs> very very heavy rain. It's not the best pictures, but you capture that essence and the atmosphere of it. Yeah, it's super important. I mean, you know, when you put whether it's for for paid ads or whether it's for organic stuff. I mean, having a good inventory of people, you know, like looking happy, smiling, having a great time. I mean, this stuff is invaluable. And actually, it's something that you need to plan for um, in advance, right? Because then come year two, if you don't have those pictures from year one, you're screwed. Basically, I mean, you need you, need, you yeah. need to wait for another year. So it's something to keep in mind to be able to get those shots from your first event. Yeah, exactly. You, you have to think like that. And it's very, that's probably one of the most challenging things I found was having to think about year two while we haven't even delivered year one. And when you haven't delivered year one, you don't know what to expect. You don't even know if people are going to turn up. I mean, people have entered your event, right? But you don't know really what to expect. You, you want to, you're briefing the pictures in, but you're thinking in the back of your head, look, if something goes wrong, do I really want pictures of this? <laughs> do I want pictures of this event? Like genuinely, that's what you think. Um, that's what I was thinking anyway, to be you know really transparent. And every race director, I think, has those thoughts. So, but then you're trying to think about the next year, like I need these pictures. When the race is over on, on the Sunday, I need to be straight on Facebook. I need to release these pictures as quick as I can. I need to get the reviews as quick as I can. It doesn't just stop when the race stops. But it's very, very hard, I think, to have that mindset in the first year to think beyond that race date because you're so, everything's hope. So all that year's worth of planning comes down to one day. So that's very tricky, but it's worth it's worth the time. Um, and I think if you're doing it for the first time, you just have to you have to go with the nature that it's going to be okay because it generally it is going to be okay. Like things always go wrong. Every event I've been at is a, there's an event debrief and things will go wrong. You learn from them. Next year, you mitigate specifically against those things. But then the next year, some other things will go wrong. Then you mitigate against those things and just so on and so on and so on. So, and I can tell you that sitting opposite where the London Marathon is about to happen. It happens from the smallest events to the biggest event. So you just have to accept that things will happen. Yeah. And actually, speaking of things going wrong, I mean, you had a, you had a postponement plus, which I guess is, is, is probably the worst thing any race director might expect. You also had a very unfortunate uh, death during one of your races, right? Which must be really super hard for a for a junior race director to to have to go through. The first the first year, which I think happened to us. I know it's happened to uh, another event in Surrey. Yeah, that that was that was very hard. That was very hard. It's it's almost it's almost surreal because you don't. It's hard to explain. You don't. It's always in the back of your head, and that's one thing I'm. I'm very, very, I'm very cautious of nowadays because we attract a lot of beginners. And this particular person, it was his first 10K. He had a heart condition that he wasn't aware of. We were so lucky with the, with the the health and safety team that we got. They were the best, um, the best around. I think very, 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 very good, very, very quick. We had first responders on in seconds. Um, it was by the finish line, so it's when you it's when you're pushing just to cross that last part, when people are pushing themselves the most. Um, there was a doctor running the race actually that funny enough was running directly next to him so they were very very lucky that we had right people in the right place you, you pay for that but until it happens on the day you don't know and there was a week before the race we had the option to get an ambulance specifically for the race we didn't have to have it all our risk assessments said we didn't need it for the number of people the situation we don't have to have it like you know 
we would be okay without it from a legal standpoint if something was to happen. And, you know, there's X cost with that. And I said, yeah, pay for it. We're going to have it. And that was the one that turned up on the scene within minutes, that exact ambulance. And I think those kind of decisions, and it's very hard, you know, that, that's a good thing. With That's a good hindsight look back that you make that decision. If, if those decisions hadn't been made, I think it'd be very, very tricky to, to push forward because you, you would think, well, what if, what if, what if? But with that situation, there's, there's no what ifs. Everything happened and we're very lucky to have the right people. Um, but it is very tough because at that moment, people are still finishing the race. So people, there's, there's, a, there's a joyous atmosphere from people. You, you're trying to work out. I was with the family in the back of the ambulance whilst people were finishing. Like just in that moment, just that was the main priority, and it's very, it's very hard. And you just, yeah, you just want to know. The first thing you want to know as a race director is: Did we do everything? Like, is everything gone to plan? Did the right people turn up? Did they get the care? And not from a selfish perspective. It's just that's that's what you want to know. You know, you don't care in that moment if you've done, if if certain things will come back in the future that might get picked up. It's just you want to know that that's happened. So, yeah, we had that happen in in the first year. Um, since then, we we talk to the family every few months. I'm in I'm in close contact with them. Um, we've always kept that up. We did we did dedicate um, on the race numbers for the next year. The, the runner his number was 27, so every runner had 27 on their race numbers. So we always do small things like that. It's not you know it doesn't change anything, but for us, it's important the family's there. And before we do the race, I always always talk to them about it, what our plans are. They they actually run it every year. A few of them run it, so we're very lucky. So obviously, they they get free places. They can bring whoever they want. And our our charity, our headline charity, is is British Heart Foundation, um, which I wanted purely because of what happened in year one. So it took me a while to get them, but because of that story, that's that's where we've gone from. So that's the charity that we help as much as we can. Right. Yeah, that's that's really important. It must have been. I mean, it must have been really hard. I didn't. I didn't mean to uh, to go into that. It's just that. You know, when you mentioned all the difficulties that that, yeah. that you face, and and knowing that you went through that, I think it would be quite instructive, particularly for for uh, young race directors listening in, to know that these things also happen. I guess very infrequently, and you know, you can you can do as much as you can, I guess, to to provide support and do all the right things. But sometimes these things uh, just happen. I guess. Yeah. So I was just about to go into. Um, Another segment, like returning to the to the marketing stuff, to the digital first stuff. What were your efforts around email? Was that something that you focused quite a lot on? Is that something that you know, like I guess for your generation and 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 people that you know, younger people, does that still mean a lot in in marketing email as it used to for for uh, you know, like people of a, of a slightly uh, you know older age? Yeah, I. We didn't we didn't do too too much. So my experience was for my first step into the space was quite was kind of we're going to email our whole database. This is when I was first working with sports events. We're going to email our database. Everyone that's entered the race, we're going to take them off that list, and then going to send a new email like once a week. The content will be very similar. It'll be enter this event. A couple of banners might change. I used to design the emails for these big events, like for the first company I worked for, and it was very. I don't know if formal is the right word. It was very, you know, regimented. There's blocks of content. Here's our sponsor. Here's our charity. Here's some blurb. Click here if you're interested. I would say it's not super engaging. So what, what I took away from that was, again, not not post, not having lots of emails. And again, from a race director starting out, you haven't got all the time to sit there and do emails. Like, it's just the honest truth. If you're in that position I was in where you're, you're doing 50 jobs, email marketing is quite low on your list, you know. Um, even as a digital first person, you, you do have to think about the logistics stuff and, and things. So uh, the approach that I took was kind of less is more, but when I'm going to do an email, I'm going to put very, very transparent content and very direct stuff. So we ended up doing kind of, I'd call them newsletters, like letters from the race director was the approach that I took. And it would be once about once a month, and it would be just a, a letter about what we did, what we were working on, what the plans for the event were, how many entries we got. Sometimes a tiny bit exaggerated, you know, just to push people. We might be sending out soon, hint, hint. <laughs> Not quite, but we did in the end. But um, just trying to, a few a few little punchlines in there. But it was from a, it was a transparent bit of content. And then that would be one. And then the next month, there might be a whole email letter from the race director. But this this month, it's about the foot care center or Weybridge Physio or the sports shop. 
And I did. that's the approach that I took because I could sit down for an hour and write that letter and it would be like honest, transparent, engaging for people, very in-depth about the community things we're doing. Like an enjoyable read for people that, that live in the town. Um, and that's the approach. That's a good that idea. Were you, doing, were you doing this as a, like, as a first person thing? So you were saying, you know, hi, I'm Matt, I'm your race director and this is what we're doing kind of thing? Exactly. And I think I look, I mean, it's hard to say in depth if that if that stuff works because at that time you know you can track x amount but for me i you know i think it works i, I the, the, the way i kind of measured it was i'd go into the, the sports shop for things like race pack collection and we'd have open days and I'd, I'd kind of sometimes just turn up and work from from that from that space or, or be in the cafe down the road and people would come in and talk about the event and I'd be sitting there and be like, oh, yeah, that's, I sent that email. And they, but they'd mention something about, oh, you guys were doing this. Or I heard about you know, this part of the, the roads being closed or the medals coming out next month. So that's how I kind of knew, you know, in my head, people are engaging. They're reading what we're putting out. Um, and it's kind of interesting. So I, I think, again, it's not super by the book. But again, with the time that we had, it worked really well. And I was, you know, Facebook events was going great. So I didn't need to do too many emails. Nowadays, I think other companies take a similar approach. I have seen it with with, e- with e-commerce platforms. They're a lot more transparent now with what they do. If there's problems, like events, they're a lot more, a lot more open. So I think the industry has gone that way anyway. No, I think, I mean, I, I see this sometimes with um, SaaS businesses. It's very popular to be sending out emails in the first person and be saying, you know, hi, I'm Matt or whatever. And, you know, sometimes they put on the CEO and, you know, like we're cynical enough to not think that, you know, like this person is actually, you know, like addressing me, like, you know, like personally me, right? He didn't sit down and write that letter just for me. But I think compared to just getting an email that says, you know, oh, you know, register now, prices are increasing, blah, blah, blah the approach of having something more personalized, a little bit more custom and sort of like, you know, going out from the command center, from the, from the people behind the scenes in the first person. I think that that could be really effective. It's, it's authentic, right? As you said, it's genuine. It's basically, you know, the voice of the event and you're building on that, on that community feeling. Yeah. And I think a lot of the price increase and the, the sold out messages, like a lot of that I saved the last month before the event, because I mean, that's when you get, especially with the 10K, that's when you get your biggest spikes. I think from being in the industry, I think 80, it's the first kind of two months, but yeah, an average 80 days before the event, you see the big spikes start to happen. Especially for a 10K, you get a lot of last minute, last minute sign up. So those, those messages you can save and you can get your big peaks at the end and you can say about the price that's changing or you've only got limited spots left or things like that. The one thing I think is, is tricky for race directors is to, is to use emails in a way that helps sponsors. That's the one thing I've always tried to crack because the way I've looked at sponsors is to give them as much value back. And I use those letters, like solace emails, if you like, and one would be dedicated to a sponsor per month because, again, that's all I really had time for. But when they got content, it was dedicated content to the runner base, all about their brand from the first person, engaging. And people would walk into uh, people would walk into those businesses the week afterwards and they, the business would call me and say, hey, we have someone come in. I'd say, yeah, that's the email, I think. <laughs> but that's quite hard, I think, you know, rather than just having banners with discounts and vouchers and emails. And I don't know if people I don't know if people connect to the business, you know, with that stuff. Yeah, I think that's exactly the kind of perspective that someone I think of your age and again probably of your of your disposition and experience, having lived with all of these digital media from a very young age, brings to this, right? I mean, this authenticity. Sometimes from, and I include myself in that kind of like cohort of, of you know, slightly older, older than you people, for sure. It's difficult to know where to begin. And sometimes, you know, you try to force yourself into being authentic and it doesn't work out, right? And it comes across even weirder kind of thing. So do you find that all of this stuff in the end gives you a better chance of attracting younger people? to to events because this industry has a very like persistent issue with attracting younger people like yourself uh into into uh running do, do, do you feel that that has helped you I, I think yeah i think so i think that approach has helped i'm 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 feeling in the same boat recently as well because there, there is a new generations coming up and there's a lot of new platforms for example that i'm i don't know if i even want to go near them 
but I feel like I should, but I feel like maybe I've missed the boat and I'm now I'm in that bracket, you know, like there's the, the new wave of things and these, these are things I'm, I'm going to start, start doing just, just learning, but it's that it's a lot more video content, right? Short, sharp video content clips. That's where, that's where you get your, your runners nowadays and being that kind of transparent, authentic content, but in the video format, people don't read anymore. People wouldn't be reading my letters. I think that I sent them two years ago. They wouldn't read that, that content. They haven't got time. So condensing that into a short video clip, and I, I loads of race directors are doing it, um, of similar age and, and and a little bit older. It's really good to see they're just going online and recording a video of themselves, walking around the race village, talking about the event. That video goes up, and then the same thing again the week after, the week after. Um, that's where it's heading. Just short, sharp clips, way less time than having to write an email like I was doing. But it's that same ethos, you know, the the transparency, authenticity of this is who I am. This is the event. It's just me and my mate, Dave, and we're going to do this event and we hope we're going to turn up. And I think people, people get it. So that, that for the younger generation is, is, the, is the key thing to get them interested. Um, and you can do that with ads now. Um, we been looking at some Instagram ads with that kind of content. It's very, very quick, you know, just buzzwords, Weybridge, 10K, race, December, you know, date, time, what it is, people get the gist. And that, that's almost what it is now. And it's subconsciously getting it into people's heads through those different short videos and then going back out at later dates and posting your content and reigniting that. That they'll be, oh, I remember seeing that. Or they're driving through the town and you've got a closed road sign up or something. So I think it's just plant, it's planting the seed, which I like. It's a term I use quite a lot. Um, I like planting the seed in people's heads for things quite early on and then coming back at a later date and being like, yeah, I know these people are going to come. But you have to start that quite early. So I think that that kind of content is where it's going to go to. But I am a little bit scared, to be honest, of what the new the new generation want to look for, and if I'm going to be in the right the right kind of place to to engage with them. But that's where you have to again by selling the race. People come in, they come, you know, younger people come in. They've got new ideas, and as a race director, you have to step back and say, you know, these people know more than me. Um, as my younger brother told me when he was doing our Instagram, I have no idea what I'm doing. So it's like, great, if you know what you're doing, then perfect. You just give them a shot. Yeah, you need. You need. I think whether you're a race director or or whatever, uh, things are changing too fast. You need to just be open to learning new things and just um, you know experimenting, experimenting with things. And the video, as you mentioned, you know, back in our age, maybe it would be like a you know slightly expensive drone filmed thing. Maybe these days, as you say, just going around doing your regular day to day race director stuff and just holding a camera phone or something and just recording like, you know, 20 sex, that's good. That's authentic. That's like, you know, and then you post it, it costs you nothing. You just need to bring yourself in that mindset of doing that and feeling comfortable doing that kind of stuff. Yeah. And you don't, you don't have to be, I don't think you don't have to be great on camera, right? It's just, a, it's a trend now people are doing it. So I look at things like that and think, geez, do people really want to see my face and, and see what I'm doing? I mean, I think in the first year for me, it would have just been me behind my laptop. So that wouldn't have worked very well. So you need to be, you know, have the right people in the right parts of the events and stuff and the right moments to do it. Um, but I think that's, yeah, I think that's where it's, that's where it's heading. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the next, the next few years. And I, I, I think from a younger race director, it's, it's very hard to, to get to that race director part and that place nowadays, unless you just go out and do it yourself. So that's one thing I'm always I'm always open to trying to see how I can help. Maybe this podcast is a, is a good first step, but just people that will have these ideas, especially around around these sports events, you know, and how to just kind of do it. Because to work your way in a company to get to that event director level, you know, it, it takes some time, and there is a certain path you go down. And I don't think you know just having an idea and doing it is that far out. You know, you do learn if you do what if you do what I did, and you. you except there's people that have been doing this way longer than you and you pull them in, health and safety, photography, you get the right people involved. All your job is is just to coordinate, you know, and you know, you take the financial bearing if it goes well, if it goes bad. Yeah, I think I think actually, like many things, setting out to plan your own race is probably easier than ever, right? Because as you say, you have all of these tools, right? You can start lean like you did, you know, you can experiment, you can, you can you know, you can focus on the things that matter rather than going all out big and, you know, like shutting down London or something. So it's, you can definitely do it easier. Speaking of which, 
as you went through that and sound like you know you were uh, one of those uh, you know one man army types what kinds of really uh, you know cool smart tools did you use particularly for your marketing to to save time and basically you know do more get more out of yourself there was a few back then things like i, I don't know if people use these now things like hootsuite you could you could post across multiple platforms i use hootsuite yeah is this still usable yeah so this is this is it i'm losing it panos i'm slowly losing it so um <laughs> losing my knowledge but um things like that to use across multiple platforms but I, I did use that i'll be really honest i did i did enjoy just going into every platform direct so i didn't i say time saving wise i think it was just not posting stuff all the time and just picking the moments and it, it's the thing it's very people say the opposite people say more content doesn't matter what it is you'll get more engagement which is true but you know more engagement isn't always the, the right engagement so i that's how i save time it was i was going to platforms direct most of the time but just picking the moments or thinking I'm, I'm in Waybridge today and there's someone running and that might be a good picture to post or that might be something interesting. Boom, done, post. Like just that off the spot, not not necessarily thinking, is it the peak time that I should be posting? Is it 6 p.m.? Are people finishing work? Are they going to see this on their train? I'm just thinking if people want to see it, they'll find it, I'm sure, somehow. And I'll, I'll do all the little quirky hashtags and see if it works. And that's, again, not by the book, but that was it. So that's how I kind of save time in a way. Just just doing things at the right moment what feels right i think it comes from the gut and like when it's your business and if it's the town that you know really well that stuff should come to you i think naturally and that's probably where the, the power is and it's like any business it's kind of a golden nugget when that happens and I've, I've done projects where i just haven't felt that and you can see it doesn't go as well or you struggle a bit or you end up it's not as natural so i think if you have that natural drive or you see something then yeah it's going to go well cool as a last thing before we go, mm. what would you say to someone who, like yourself, a few years back, you know, being 23, 24, they want to, they want to, you know, they look around in, in their town, nothing's happening. They want to launch a race. Any words of advice for someone who's, who's, who's done that and actually with some great success with Waybridge? <laughs> don't, don't do it. It's stressful. I'd say. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, um, no, it's, it's, it's nice. It's nicely stressful. Every race director will tell you it's stressful, but that's what, that's why we keep doing it. Right. So, um, that's why I'm here today. Everything's, everything's a big project. I think it's, it's again, everyone that comes through the other side, it's easier to say this just, just to kind of do it. But I think it's, it's not hard. To, it's not hard to start a race, but I think the one thing I learned was I found that going big was the winner. And I've seen loads of people take different approaches. You can set up a, a small trail run, you know, aim for maybe a 50, 100 people. Your costs are very small and you can try and grow that. And that, that can go really well. And you can have many of those. Some people do great businesses. But I, I don't know. I found just taking a, taking a bit of risk if you can. If you can afford to take some risk, take some risk. Go a little bit bigger. Invest in in aspects that you think are unique to your market. In my case, it was the medal and, and the route, the obvious ones. But anything unique. And then that risk, I think the risk will pay off. So I think it's it's finding that risk in the right areas, and then I think don't be afraid to to accept you don't you don't know everything, and you can learn as you go. It is possible to learn as you go. I'd sold a thousand tickets to an event, and I was still working out the event. We were still we were still measuring the course. It was two kilometers too short, you know, a month before race day, <laughs> and we were we were finding trying to find two kilometers on a ten k. We were very off in our measuring, <laughs> so it's it's just accepting that you know those things will happen. You have to take a bit of a hit. And um, you can learn as you go. And I think that's, maybe it takes a certain kind of person. You know, I've always been that person to go into things that aren't in my comfort zone, absorb all the stress and just be like, I'm going to work it out. If I'm sat here at midnight trying to work it out, if I'm Googling it, if I'm asking someone for advice, I don't mind. I'll ask 50 questions and at some point I'll understand it. So I think that's, that's the thing. You don't have to do, a, you don't necessarily have to do a course or a degree in it or I think finding the right people to surround yourself with takes some guidance and, and it's not it's not that difficult to be honest and it's a nice kind of stress because the buzz when it's over is is amazing <laughs> and then you just do it again the next year and you don't know why you've done it the next year but you always go back and do it again and that's once you've coped with that stress i think of the first race then I, i'm sat here now before probably the biggest weekend for nuco and us as a company we're launching the ballot on a new product Go to the marathon on Sunday, and I'm 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 actually quite calm, and I think it's because I've race directed an event, 
that this, this is nothing for me compared to that. So that's that's the thing you come out of it, I think. It makes you stronger. Definitely. Is there any way people can reach out to you if they uh, want to, you know, like, again, someone aspiring, if you want to, if you want help, if you want to help someone out or someone has any questions for you or want to reach out to you, how can they get through to you? I'd say LinkedIn is always the best platform. Um, I find that really easy to work with. So and I'm quite, I always try and be generous with my time because people have always helped me so much. So I'm always trying to give time to people. I'll always have a phone call with anyone in our space. and. Yeah won't won't try and sell anything to anyone generally help people in the industry so i speak to people just for fun i meet people in london all the time over a coffee just for fun just to share ideas um so linkedin's the best way i'm always open to to anything i can do to help okay we'll put your uh linkedin uh profile link in the show notes uh you should also by the way if you have some time you should come into the Race Directors Hub group we have on Facebook. And that many people don't know that, but there's an actual mentorship function that the group has. Many groups have it on, on Facebook. And lots of experienced race directors have signed up. And lots of you know, like new people uh, coming into the industry go there. And there's a way that Facebook, you know, pairs up mentors and mentees and, and, you know, like one can help each other out in specific areas or more generally. So if you have some time do come into the group and like put up like a mentor profile. I think lots of people in the back of this podcast may want to, may want to, you know, like be your mentees. So thank you very much for your time today, no, Matt. Uh, it's a really stressful time, I guess now with London, uh, all the best Bye. with London marathon weekend. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks again for all the help you're giving out to uh, younger people. Thanks to everyone listening in and we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks, Carlos. I hope you enjoyed this episode on growing races with a digital first focus with my guest, Weybridge 10K's Matt Trevett. You can find more resources on anything and everything related to race directing on our website, racedirectorshq.com. You can also share your questions about launching and growing your race or anything else in our Facebook group, Race Directors Hub. If you enjoyed this episode, please don't forget to subscribe or leave a review on your favorite player. And also check out the podcast back catalog for more great content like this. Until our next episode, take care and keep putting on amazing races.